Hello, this is Professor Matt Kutrulis of Rio Hondo College, and this is the first video for Chapter 7 on the topic of solutions for Chemistry 110, Chemistry for Allied Health Majors. Before we get into solutions in depth, let's just go out a bit and talk a little bit more in detail about mixtures. You'll recall that we first mentioned the classification of matter into pure substances and mixtures back in chapter one. Now we want to break down mixtures in a little bit more detail. The first thing that you need to know about a mixture is that unlike compounds, its composition is not fixed, meaning that we can't get down to an atom by atom ratio. Think about salt water, for example. No matter how hard we try, is it possible to make salt water in a perfect atom to atom ratio? No. Even if you measure salt out to the greatest level of accuracy possible, there's no way that you're going to get down to an atom to atom ratio. It's simply not possible. We can further break down mixtures into two classifications. First, we have homogeneous mixtures, in which case all of the parts are in the same state, so it's either a gas throughout or a liquid or a solid, and furthermore, all of the parts must be mixed together. And you can essentially use your eyes to make the judgment on whether something is a homogeneous mixture or not. If you look at it and all of the parts look visually inseparable, it looks consistently the same all throughout, we can call it a homogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous mixtures are just mixtures which are not homogeneous. So for example, they might have two different components in different states. So there might be a liquid with a solid in it. Or there might be two liquids which are combined but not mixed. So if we look at the mixture on the left, it is salt water. And notice that you can't really see any difference between the salt water at the top, in the middle, or at the bottom. It's all uniform throughout. On the other hand, if we have mud, mud is going to be heterogeneous. You'll notice that the concentration of the dirt gets uh, greater as you get lower and lower until we see quite a bit of dirt here at the bottom. Um, and there's definitely more than one state here. We have liquid and solid. Another important thing that distinguishes mixtures from uh, compounds is the way that they can be separated. So we can always separate mixtures by some sort of a physical method. And for example, if we had like a heterogeneous mixture of a solid and a liquid, like for example coffee grounds, a solid with water, a liquid, we can separate them simply by filtration. The solid coffee grounds stay behind on the filter paper while the water solution, which would be coffee, goes through. If we have a homogeneous mixture, like for example salt water, we can separate the salt from the water by simply boiling the water off, and the salt stays behind in the container. With compounds, you cannot separate them in such a way, by using a physical barrier or by simply trying to affect a state change, like from liquid to solid or gas to liquid you need to actually have some kind of a chemical reaction which would also in some cases include using electricity and these would be able to separate some compounds depending on the particular reaction. So let's practice with these mixtures here. So we'd like to distinguish these between homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures and so we want to classify them and give an explanation as to why. So I would recommend pausing the video for just a moment, and then when you come back, we'll go over these. I'm assuming you're back, so let's take a look at the first. Vodka, which I'm assuming most of you have seen, is a mixture of water and ethyl alcohol, and it looks just like water. So that is going to be a homogeneous mixture. All parts are liquid, and they're thoroughly mixed. They all look the same. Cheerios and milk. Well, Cheerios is solid and milk is liquid, so different states would mean that we have a heterogeneous mixture. A mixture of oil and water. 
They are both liquids, however, they do not mix with one another. And you need to mix for them to be homogeneous mixtures. So these are heterogeneous mixtures. Air is a solution of gases. And normally, any one pocket of air is going to look the same as any other pocket of air. So we would say that this is a homogeneous solution. And finally, if we were to look at some air that was completely filled with dust, we could go ahead and consider that heterogeneous because the dust particles would be a solid floating around in the gas. So before we get into solutions, I just want to warn you a bit that there are a lot of terms in this chapter, and it's very important that you keep them straight because each one of them has its own special meaning. So first, let's define the term solution. So when we say we have a solution, that generally means we have a homogeneous mixture. And it can be thought of as containing two parts. The solute, or solutes if there's multiple ones, which is the compound which you have dissolved to make the solution. And the solute is dissolved in the solvent. As we saw with vodka, the solute does not have to be a solid. It can be a liquid, and in some cases, like ammonia, it could be a gas. In general, if we are stuck trying to figure out which is the solute and which is the solvent, like if they're both liquids, you would choose the one which is present in the larger amount to be the solvent. That doesn't usually happen. In most of the experiments we do in this class, water is the solvent. So let's say we wanted to make sugar water. We would dissolve sugar, a solute, in water, which is the solvent, and that gives us a solution. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about concentration a little bit later in the chapter, and the concentration will tell us how much solute there is in a given amount of solution. If we say that a solution is concentrated, that generally means that there's quite a bit of solute in it. It doesn't always mean that it's the maximum possible amount, but it's essentially a way of saying a lot. On the other hand, if there's a fairly small amount of solute, or even not a small amount, but a, an amount that's reasonably smaller than a concentrated solution, we would call it dilute. Now the problem here with these terms is they are very vague and subject to context. So all we're saying here is that these are used as relative terms. If I say solution A is more concentrated than solution B, that means A has more solute. And if I said solution C is more dilute than solution D, that would mean C has less solute. A colloid is a type of solution in which the particles are much larger than normal for a regular homogeneous solution. And the particles are still small enough though that if you go to filter them they will pass through filter paper. So they're much larger than ions in a typical solute uh, or small molecules but they still are able to fit through pores in paper. And if a colloid is left to settle for a considerable amount of time, the particles actually do not settle in the standard way. They don't fall to the bottom of the container. Because of the large sized particles, it's usually common that the colloids are going to be opaque. In other words, you can't see through them. Opaque would be the opposite of transparent. And if we're thinking about colloids, milk is probably the best example of a colloid of liquid on liquid. There's actually a wide variety of colloids out there that are not always liquid within liquid. Uh, for example, marshmallows are gas within solid. Uh, we have fog, which is large liquid particles in a gas. So, But we're only going to look for right now at liquid liquid colloids. A suspension on the other hand contains even larger particles 
than with a colloid. And these particles are heavy enough that gravity will pull them to the bottom of a container over time. So we say they settle. And therefore, we consider them to be heterogeneous mixtures because there is a distinct separation between the solute and the solvent, even if it takes time for those to separate out. The particles in a suspension, if you try to filter them, the particles will stay behind. And we mention suspensions because they are very useful in medical contexts. Uh, for example, eye drops and ear drops are commonly given as suspensions. Um, and we cannot simply leave eye and ear drops sitting in a medicine cabinet and then use them straight away because by that point the antibiotic medicine will have settled to the bottom. So we have to shake uh, suspensions in order to get the medication to evenly spread throughout the liquid. When we take an ionic compound and we dissolve it in water, not only does the compound dissolve, meaning it seems to visually disappear, it will break up into separate ions. And the word for that is dissociation. So we say the ions separate. For common soluble ionic compounds like table salt, when we add them to water, they completely dissociate until the maximum number of uh, particles is held for that particular solute in solution. We call that saturated. I'll talk more about this in a moment. There are other ionic compounds which are not soluble. And even though they don't appear to dissolve, there's always a very small amount of them which do dissociate. And so what this means is there will still be some ions when you put an insoluble ionic compound in water, even though you might not notice it. And where the term electrolytes comes into play is a solution that contains these ions conducts an electric current. We can divide electrolytes into three broad categories, or rather we can break up the solutions into three broad categories. So if we take a solution and we make this by using a soluble ionic compound, like again table salt, so sodium nitrate also, potassium nitrate, there's many, many soluble ionic compounds. When these dissociate, they form a lot of ions in solution. And so this gives us what we call a strong electrolyte. So any soluble ionic compound gives you a strong electrolyte solution. There are other types of compounds which do this as well, called strong acids and strong bases. And we will discuss those in chapter 8. If you have a solution which has an ionic compound that is not very soluble, only slightly soluble. What that means is the solution still produces some ions, but not very many. And so if there's not very many ions in the solution, the solution will still conduct electricity, but not very well. So it has quite a high resistance to conducting electricity. We need the ions to act as shuttles to carry the electricity around. So this would be called a weak electrolyte solution. We'll talk more about weak electrolytes in the next chapter when we talk about weak acids and weak bases, which are probably the best example of this class of compound. And finally, if we have a solution which is derived from completely non-ionic sources, so covalent molecules, and these molecules don't break up and form ions. Uh, most covalent compounds won't. Some will. Um, then there's nothing there to conduct an electric current. So we would call that a non-electrolyte. So again, in looking at these for right now, strong electrolytes are soluble ionic compounds, whereas non-electrolytes tend to be soluble non-ionic compounds. Weak electrolytes are a little bit tricky, and we will talk more about them in the next chapter. Solubility essentially tells us how much solute will be dissolved in a particular solvent. We can first approach this in very general terms. 
And what we say is, if a compound is soluble, that means most or all of it that's added to uh, the solvent will dissolve, usually with some stirring or shaking. If a compound is insoluble, very little of it, or maybe even none of it, will dissolve. So if it's a solid and you add it into, for example, water, it will eventually settle to the bottom of the container if it's insoluble and doesn't dissolve. In between these, we might have something which we would call slightly soluble, where you might notice a lot of it dissolves, but not all. So the exact solubility of a compound is a value that we typically can look up. Um, but it's going to most often be temperature dependent. And so normally what we need to do is we need to look up the solubility on a graph, which just shows how the solubility changes over different temperatures. Most solutes, which are not gases, tend to dissolve in greater amounts as the temperature is increased. There are exceptions to this, but they're relatively few. Gases, on the other hand, as we'll see in a moment, are usually less soluble at high temperatures. So they're definitely the opposite of liquid and solid solutes. Now, we talked only in general terms a moment ago with terms like soluble and insoluble and slightly soluble. We can come up with a more quantitative amount, um, as I would mentioned before, by reading values off of tables or graphs. And we can see these uh, usually measured in grams of the solute that are soluble for every 100 milliliters of the solvent. So let's do a simple example of this. So let's say I'm looking at a graph that shows the solubility of potassium chloride at different temperatures. And I see on the graph that at 40 degrees Celsius, 42.5 grams of potassium chloride will dissolve in 100 milliliters of water. What I would like to know is if I have 250 milliliters of water, how much potassium chloride can dissolve? So again, we have 42.5 grams for every 100 milliliters of water. If you had 200 milliliters of water, the ratio would have to stay the same, so this would be twice as much. If you had 10 milliliters of water, this would be one-tenth of that value. So this is just a simple matter of ratios. Let's go ahead and take a look at this problem and work it out in the notes view. So the first thing we want to do is note what is the given value here. And the given value would be the volume, and that is 250 milliliters of water, the solvent. And we're just going to use our standard technique using conversion factors. So I would like to be able to cancel out milliliters of water. And the solubility is 42.5 grams for every 100 milliliters of water. So I write 100 milliliters of water in the denominator. And up here in the denominator, I am putting 42.5 grams of potassium chloride, the solute. The milliliters of water cancel. And putting this into my calculator gives me 106 grams of potassium chloride for the given amount, 250 mLs, of water. So in this last problem, we just saw a maximum amount of a compound which can be dissolved. And that maximum amount tells us when the solution is said to be saturated. If we try to add any more solute than the amount that was given in that limit, it would not dissolve. It would simply settle to the bottom of the container and remain there. On the other hand, if you do not add enough solute to reach that solubility limit, we have a solution which is unsaturated, which simply means that it can accommodate more solute.
Let's take a quick look at the solubility of gases. Now, many gases out there are able to dissolve in water, um, although often to only a limited extent. For example, we know carbon dioxide can dissolve in water in soft drinks and in seltzer water, although there is definitely a limitation to that. We notice whenever we open up the soda bottle that the carbon dioxide immediately starts to bubble out. So the two things that really affect solubility for gases are temperature of the solution, which we already saw was the case for solids and liquids but also the pressure of the gas above the liquid. So if it's in its container, where the pressure of the gas would be the gas which is right over the liquid solution. And unlike what we saw with solid compounds, most gases are more soluble at lower temperatures. Also, the higher the pressure of a gas that we implement above a solvent, the more of it that you can generally get to dissolve within that solvent. And we call this last statement here Henry's Law. And carbon dioxide is probably the best example of a compound uh, which, when there is a high pressure, it can be forced to dissolve in, for example, water as a solvent. But over time, the carbon dioxide will eventually come out, and we would have in the case of a soda, a flat soda. Going back to chapter 4, you'll recall that I mentioned uh, in the context of intermolecular forces the phrase like dissolves like. And what that generally told us is that polar compounds tend to dissolve well in polar solvents. So, for example, water being the most polar solvent, we can usually put certain compounds which are polar in it. And this is going to include many, but certainly not all, ionic compounds. So for example, uh, silver nitrate dissolves very well in water. Silver chloride, on the other hand, does not dissolve. So there's definitely exceptions. And polar compounds, uh, specifically those that contain polar covalent bonds, um, but mostly we're going to be limited to compounds that have low molar masses and in particular compounds which uh, are able to form hydrogen bonds. Compounds which are nonpolar on the other hand don't tend to dissolve very well in polar solvents especially water but they are usually very soluble in nonpolar solvents and the most common types of nonpolar solvents are what we call hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons are simply solvents or compounds which contain only carbon and hydrogen. We will study this class of compound in chapters 10 and 11. But just to give you a few examples of some typical solvents that you might see in the lab, there's hexane, which has formula C6H14, cyclohexane, which has formula C6H12, and toluene, which has formula C7H8. The only kinds of bonds that are in any of these compounds are bonds between carbon and carbon, and between carbon and hydrogen. And as we've already discussed, those bonds are considered to be nonpolar covalent. Let's go back to looking at ions for a moment. If we take ions and we dissolve them, uh, we form an aqueous solution. So a solution where the solvent is water. Uh, this would be, of course, a strong electrolyte solution because the compound has dissolved and dissociated. What happens in that dissociation process is that the water molecules surround ions and ultimately are able to pull the ions away from one another. And they form what we might call a solvation cage. So that's the term that we use, solvation, for being able to separate these ions out. And we have a new kind of attractive force that we use here, which is simply called an ion-dipole interaction. So the attraction of a positive ion for the negative part of a dipole, or a negative ion for a positive part of a dipole. Let's look at a picture of this 
that will hopefully make it more clear. So let's say we've added sodium chloride, just ordinary table salt, to water here. So you'll notice the ions have not only dissolved, meaning they're mostly uh, separated from one another. You don't see too much solid here. But the ions are also dissociated, meaning that the sodiums, these white spheres, and the chlorides, the green spheres, are no longer together. If we were to blow up this picture and look, for example, at just the sodium ions, they are positively charged. They're cations. They will be surrounded by the partial negative oxygens that we see here. In two dimensions, we're seeing that there are four water molecules surrounding this. In reality, there's six, because there will also be one coming from the front of your screen and one that would be at the back of the screen. The chloride ion is negatively charged, so it's going to want to be located near the pos partially positive hydrogen atoms that we see here. Again, this is not hydrogen bonding. This is an ion dipole force, which is based on the force of all attractions, which is the attraction of positive for negative. I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here. And in the next video, we'll take a look at different terms regarding concentration and the calculation of those concentrations. Thank you.